نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم سل وسلم بارك على سيدنا فلان محمد تب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسهبه دائما أبدا Salatum wa salaman alayka ya Sayyidi Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Last week we were talking about The princess of Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Bibi Fatima Salamu wa alayha And there are certain things that I mentioned That I didn't have time to clarify on last week So we'll clarify some of those before we move on One thing that I mentioned was that she, you know, when she went to Abu Bakr, Radion, she didn't take anybody else other than the uncle of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat, Hazrat uh, uh, Abbas, Radion. And the reason that is significant is that if she truly wanted to gain some wealth or inheritance, she should have taken somebody who, you know, was a someone who could claim some of that wealth as well. You know, she should have taken somebody who would have been due the inheritance, which would have been her sons or her husband, you know, or you know, the, the brother of her husband, Aqil, you know, or some of his sons. You know, Islamically all of these could have inherited, technically could have inherited from Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. But she took Abbas. And if you look at Abbas, he is, he is the uncle of Rasulullah But his mother is different than the mother of the father of Rasulullah So under Islamic law, he could not inherit if there are surviving relatives of someone who, who is a direct descendant of both mother and father. So if you look at, you know, the Abu Talib's mother, was the same as Hazrat Abdullah's mother. You know, the father of Rasulullah Sallallahu Hazrat Abdullah, his mother and the mother of Abu Talib are the same. Their fathers are the same definitely, but their mothers are also the same. Hazrat Abbas has the same father, but a different mother. So technically in Islamic, you know, and that's one of the brilliance, you know, if you look at even some of the Orientalists have to acknowledge this, because there are some of these Orientalists who, who put this claim out that, oh, Rasulullah Sallallahu you know, he, he, you know, he had some mental illness, that's that for a while. Or he had seizures, that's that for a while. You know, this is something that they threw out there, you know. But there are some amongst themselves who, who, who acknowledge that there's no way he could have had some mental illness because there's no way that someone who has a mental illness could give such a complicated inheritance law to the world. You know, if you look at the inheritance law of Islam, it is complete and it is just every way you look at it. You know, and there are rules for anyone who, who you know, who can inherit, who can't inherit, how much they inherit, everything is laid out under Islamic law to the extent that the Islamic scholars are the ones who had to come up with algebra. And if you actually look at algebra, you know, everybody talks about calculus, calculus, as far as mathematics. Algebra is a more complicated form of mathematics than calculus. And they had to come up with, cal with algebra in order to simplify calculating the rules of inheritance in Islam. And so, you know, again, you know, just if you don't remember anything from what I just <coughs> said, just remember that Abbas Radio had no share of the inheritance of Rasulullah, even if Rasulullah's inheritance was to be given to anybody. And that's the one that's the one person that she took 
when she went to talk to Abu Bakr. And again, these are people who preferred the Ummah over themselves. And these aren't ordinary people. Uh, again, we should not think of them like ourselves. That's, that's where the problem comes in. You know, as I mentioned, you know, there's a so-called scholar from Pakistan. You know, he's got a PhD in Islamic studies and you know, all these other great titles. You know, he's, he's uh, graduated from some very uh, prestigious Islamic schools. Knows Arabic very well, you know, very good in the language and, and knows various other languages very well. But when you cross a certain line, then the heart becomes sealed. And this is, you know, so he made this statement that she, uh, you know, she was at wrong, or she was wrong to have go, gone and asked, or she made a mistake when she went and asked you know, for this. Because he's thinking of her as himself. You know, this is a woman, again, who, who grew up in the household of Rasulullah She is not, oh, she did not only grow up in that household, she is part of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's, there's, this is also a distinction. You know, every child is a part of their parent. And so there was no need, if it was simply that, that Rasulullah was emphasizing, he would, there was no need for him to say that she's a part of me. Everybody knew she's a part of him because she's his daughter. You know, just like with Imam Hussein al Islam, you know, everybody knew he was his grandson. Yet Rasulullah says, Al Hussein o minni wa ana min al Hussein. That Hussein is from me and I am from. Hussein, if he was simply emphasizing that this is his grandson, everybody, there was no dispute about that, so there was no need for him to even mention it. And Rasulullah did not waste words. Same way here, everybody, there was no dispute whether she was his daughter or not. No one disputed that, that issue. And yet she, he emphasizes the point that she is part of me. And immediately after saying that she is part of him, she, he says that whatever pleases her pleases me, and whatever displeases her displeases me. Yeah. So this again takes it to a different level. So yeah, she grew up in the household, but she is a part of him. She is truly his blood. The Quran is being revealed in front of her. So you can imagine the level of knowledge. You know, she's not like us, that she's doing something and she doesn't know what she's doing. You know, even when Ali Radio was asked during his khilaf about certain things he did, he said that I do not do anything except under the guidance of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is Bibi Fatima, Salamu Alaihi she did not do anything other than under the guidance of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these are things that we need to remember. You know, and this is where, you know, when we look at Surah Adab, Surah Hujarat, Surah number 49, and the first verse, and the first two verses, they, both of them start off with, Ya Yuhal Ladina And, you know, we look at these verses and it says, you know, O oh, you who believe, do not go ahead of Allah and His Messenger. You know? And you know, the thing though is, you know, when you think about it, okay, don't go ahead. You know, you th we, we think of it in physical terms. Of simply, okay, going ahead of the messenger, walking in front of him. But in the end of the verse, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah sami'un alim. He doesn't say basirun alim. He says, and Allah is hearing and knowing. Hmm? Meaning, you know, don't say something about the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that tries to put you ahead of him. And then the next verse, yeah, it also starts out with Ya Yuhal Ladina Amin, O you who believe. So again, these aren't verses being addressed to the disbelievers. 
these are being addressed to those people who claim to say la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah those who people who know that muhammad ibn abdullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is truly the messenger of allah hmm? and so it's ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tarfu aswatakum fawqa sawti an-nabi wa la tajharu lahu tajharu lahu Oh, you who believe. That do not raise your voices above the voice of the messenger. And do not talk to him. You know, like you talk to each other. And the warning is that you, Otherwise I will wipe away your deeds And you won't even know about it Meaning what? What does that mean? That means that there will be no toba. You won't even be able to repent for it Because you can't acknowledge that you made a mistake And the, the second criteria for making toba. The first criteria is to accept yourself as the, as the servant of Rasulullah. So some of the second criteria for Tawbah is that you acknowledge that you've made a mistake. And if you can't acknowledge you made a mistake, then there is no Tawbah. There is no repentance. And so Allah is saying that if you talk to the Messenger, and also means if you talk about the Messenger, like you talk about your, you know, to each other or, or uh, about each other, then I will wipe away your deeds. Now, that meaning you have crossed the line beyond which there is no return. Hmm? And so, if the whole is the sum of the parts, and Bibi Fatima Salamullah is a part of Rasulullah hmm? then to talk about her, like we talk about anybody else, is also crossing that line. And this is why when we look at this scholar who made these statements, immediately you have other scholars who caught him on it. Wrote him very nice letters, even verbal called him. And said, look, you need to take this back. You know, you need to, you know, you made the statement publicly, which means that demands a public repentance as well. You know, if you made it in, in a small group, you need to just repent in that small group. Or if you do something secretly, you repent secretly. <laughs> but if, if you, in Islam, if you make a mistake like this, openly, in public, the repentance also has to be in public. You know, it's like when the Imam is leading the Salat, and he makes a mistake, you know, he can't go afterwards and say, Oh, Allah, forgive me. No, he has to make the, he has to make the correction then. Because he's made the mistake, in public. And so, what does this guy do? First day, he, he doubles down on it. Hmm? Says, no, you know, this is, you know, what I said was right. Second day, uh, the third day, afterwards, you know, when people are continuing to insist that, look, you need to correct yourself on this. Uh, he says, oh, you know, uh, you know, I didn't say it. And then after that, you know, conflicting statements. Yeah, I did say it, but it meant this, or I did say it, and well, yeah, I'm correct. And still today, it's been yeah, at least two or three weeks now, still no re public repentance. And everybody is telling him, look, this will not lower your status, this will raise your status. You know, if you do this, if you repent for what you've said. You know, in Islam, repentance is, is, is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. To the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Hadith Qudsi that if you do not sin and repent, then I would wipe you away and bring up people who will. You know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when his, humble, when his servants humble themselves to him. But the fact is that once you've crossed that line, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seals the heart. See, it's one thing if someone who didn't know made this statement. 
you know, for him the door of repentance would remain open. You know, it's like non-Muslims talking against Rasulullah and they eventually later on they become Muslim. Why? Because, you know, they didn't know when they were saying what they were saying. But it's another thing when you're supposed to be so learned and such a scholar and then you lower yourself to make this statement against the daughter of Rasulullah You know better. And if you know better, then why did you do that? And it's also a different thing, okay, you know, you're talking and in the heat of the moment, you know, some words come out and you just kind of, you know, just say something. And again, the door of repentance for that is also open. But then when you know what you've said, and you, you know, kind of uh, uh, plant your feet firm, uh, you know, against what is right, then again, that door becomes closed again. And this is what we, and this is, you know, and this is where, you know, on so many different levels we see this. And this is, because, this is also where, you know, the Sufia, they say, Al-ilmu hijab al-akbar. That knowledge is the greatest veil. It blinds you. You know, because you gain a little knowledge and now you become arrogant. Oh, I know. And now you want to challenge those who truly knew. And of course, you know, the, the, our children these days are being bombarded from every direction you know, with various fitna. You, know, you have to deal with this fitna and various other fitnas. And then also, you know, from every angle, you know, it's like, oh, just, you know, like this thing, oh, I'm just human. You hear this? I'm just human. And what they mean by that is, I'm, I'm only human means that, oh, I'm, I'm human, but I'm not nothing else, means that religion and nothing else matters. And that's what they mean by that. Or, you know, it's just who I am. This is what I do. You know, and there are certain sins, you know, that a person does. And he knows, like in Islam, you know, if you commit a crime, or if you, if you commit a sin, and you know that you've committed a sin and you acknowledge that this is wrong. You know, you're still Muslim. But if you start justifying it, and there are certain things if you start justifying, then that takes you out of Islam. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran as well, as far as like, you know, this, this attitude of, oh, this is just who I am and this is. You know what I do. You know, if you read the story of Musa and uh, you know Samri, <clears throat> the one who who made the golden calf. You know, and then he took the dust that he saw where Jibril Islam's horse was standing, and he took the dust from underneath his hoof, and he put it in the mouth of that calf, and that calf started making this noise. Uh, 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 you know, this lowly noise. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about you know, in the Quran from the barqa of that dust. You know, and why he didn't take the dust from Musa al Islam is a different issue and something maybe we'll cover later. But he does this and people, of course, many people among the children of Israel, they start worshiping this calf. When Musa al Islam comes back, you know, because he was gone for 40 days, so after that he comes back and he sees what they're doing, you know, he rebukes them all. Uh, and he asked Samri, he says, why did you do this? What made you do this? What does Samri say? He says, I, my nafs. You know, I, just, I just wanted to. Basically what that means is I just wanted to. This is just what I wanted to do. You know, in Surah Yusuf, uh, a beautiful verse, all the verses are beautiful, of course, but you know, one of the verses, which is the first uh, verse of uh, the 13th Jews. Well, that's not that's, well, what, what is said in that verse, I would be left in that. Wamao barrio nafsi in the nafsalamarata. Wamao barrio nafsi. 
Inna nafsa la marat bisubuhu illa ma rahma Rabbi. Inna Rabbi ghafurur rahim. That I do not absolve my nafs. Inna nafsa la marat bisub. That truly the nafs, you know, is persistently pushing you toward evil. Illa ma rahma Rabbi. Except for the one upon whom my Lord has mercy. Inna Rabbi Ghafoor Rahim. Indeed, my Lord is forgiving and merciful. You know, in Surah Wat-Teen, you know, Allah SWT talks about, you know, mankind being created from the best of modes. And then he says that he's lower to the lowest of the low. And then, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ amanu. And accept those who have belief and iman, amanu, iman, which is what? The love of Allah and His Messenger. So those who have this, and along with that, they do the righteous deeds, because that love pushes them to do the righteous deeds. So the nafs, the nature of the nafs, you know, the self, like when Samani, he says, when Musa asked him, What made you do this? He says, My nafs. You know, myself. So the nafs is continuously pushing us toward what is wrong. Except upon whom Allah has mercy. But he also tells us who he shows his mercy to. And again, the ones who, who, who attain his mercy are the ones who love his beloved. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the ones that his beloved وسلم, loves. So they take that, uh, that nafs that is pushing them toward the evil, and now they redirect it toward what is good. You know, but this common statement these days, oh, it's just, you know, it's who I am, it's what I do. Just what I want to do. And this is that evil nafs. But again, the only way to safeguard ourselves from that is to look toward the mercy of Allah. And when we say mercy of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us who His mercy is. You know, because, you know, unfortunately, a lot of us, we have this abstract concept of, oh, you know, the mercy of Allah, the mercy of Allah, you know, Allah's going to show, uh, shower us with His mercy. This abstract concept. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, tells us who His mercy is. And His mercy is not other than Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ma'a rasalnaka illa rahmata lil alameen. You know, that we did not send you except as a mercy to all of creation. Rahmatulil Alameen. Not just to mankind. And so this is, you know, we see this, you know, attack. Not just on our children, but on ourselves. And on everybody these days. Again, from every direction. Uh, it's, it's a net that's cast 360 degrees. And Shaitan, you know, when he was being kicked out of Jannah, and he asked Allah SWT to give him respite, you know, to deceive the children of, of Adam or the progeny of Adam, Allah SWT gives it to him. And what does he say? He said, I will come to them from their front, from their back, from their right, from their left. You know, it's a 360 degree net. So most people they think, oh, you know, there's no way to escape. But the way to escape is to humble ourselves before Allah. You know, to, to bow to our Lord. And it doesn't have to be a physical bowing here. Of course, in Salat we do the physical bowing, but to bow to our Lord is to humble our, ourselves to Him. And then to look for his mercy to descend. You know, and in Sufia, uh, this is what maraqaba is. You 
know, what meditation, a lot of people, marakaba, you know, they talk about meditation and, and the concept is something different. You know, marakaba in, in tasawwuf is the annihilation of the self, basically becoming totally empty, except waiting for the mercy of Allah to come. It is, it is, it is the intizar or the, or the, uh, the patience, you know, being patient for Allah's mercy to come, to descend. Because when you annihilate the self and everything else, what else remains? La ilaha illallah. So if everything is annihilated, the only thing that remains is your Lord. And so, you know, and this is, you know, this is just the, uh, you know, this is a way of defending ourselves you know, from all of the fitna that we see today. This web of Dajjal that spread all around. And of course the internet, uh, you know, which has given every illegitimate person a voice. You know, because before the fitna they were there, but they didn't spread as easily. You know, so you had, it was much easier to have the checks. So now anybody can say anything and get a million followers. Yeah, just like that. And the more crazy the things you say, <laughs> you know, the more odd you say things, the more followers you get. You know, it's like I've got three minutes, so in those three minutes, you know, just, you know it's like this, uh, this so-called scholar again. This is another so-called scholar uh, from Pakistan. I think he's in Canada now. Uh, but... Uh, and he comes up with some of the dumbest things. That, that, and people say, oh, wow, what did he say? It's such a great thing. You know, but if you look at what he's saying, if you truly start analyzing what he's saying, it has no, no basis for anything. And, and the interesting thing, he'll even say it, if, if you even listen to his wording, you know, he says, well, in my opinion, this is it. Okay, well, what's your opinion based upon? He doesn't tell you that. He's in my opinion. Based on what? You know, like, you know, he's one of those who says that, oh yeah, you know, the moon was split, but Rasulullah didn't split it. So he acknowledges that the, the splitting of the moon occurred, you know, and, and the proof that he gives for his, his argument is, you know, in Surah Qamar, uh, you know, the first verse is, اِقْتَرَبَتَ السَّعَدَ وَانْشَقَّ الْقَمَرَ that the hour is near and the moon is split asunder. So he says, see, you know, this is just a sign for the times. Sign for sign of the hour. So you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala just caused this to happen. And there's no there's no uh, proof that Rasulullah so some did it. Because he knows most people won't even pick up the Quran to read it. And if they do read it, he's already poisoned their mind so they can't even see beyond what he just said. Because if you read the very next verse of that of that surah, the very next verse is what? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, and when they see the signs, talking about the kuffar, that when they see the signs of Allah, they say, oh, this is nothing but evident magic. Sihram mustamir. Evident magic. So, which automatically tells you that even the kuffar of Quraysh, attributed this action to somebody and who was that somebody who came with the signs of Allah other than Rasulullah <laughs> you know because if it's, if it's simply a natural occurrence and no one says that it's magic you know when an earthquake happens no one says oh this is magic unless somebody comes out and says oh I made this happen so even the Quraysh the kuffar of Quraysh had more sense than this so, this so-called scholar. So, inshallah, time's up. Uh, we'll talk about something else next week, inshallah. Uh, but uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and, and protect us and uh, fill our hearts with His love and the love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu mm -hmm. alaihi wasallam, his family, his companions, and all of those who they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah, go ahead and make sunnah, inshallah.